Hi, this is part two, the fuel system. We're going to talk about how we built the fuel delivery system to get the juice into the engine to get it to run. Now to begin with, when you're fueling up one of these jet engines, a lot of people when they first start the project will use propane as the fuel, and there's a couple of advantages and disadvantages to that. The major advantage in using propane as the fuel is because of the very high vapor pressure, about 125 PSI at room temperature. The pressure in the tank is sufficient to drive the propane into the engine and you don't need a fuel pump. In addition, because it has such a high vapor pressure, it very quickly mixes with the air and you tend to get a very easy start and an easy burn. The disadvantage with using propane and the way, reason that you eventually might want to move to a liquid fuel system is that the tanks themselves are bulky. They're heavy and for the amount of fuel that you, can, that you hold, you're taking on a lot of additional weight. So if you're putting this on a mobile application like say a go-kart or something, it's kind of a bulky tank to bring around with you. Now there's a bigger, more serious problem with using propane. And that is in order to deliver the vapor into the engine, as the vapor leaves, leaves the tank, what replaces it is boiling liquid propane. And because propane is a hydrocarbon, it has a fairly large amount of energy for the phase transition from liquid to vapor, meaning it takes a lot of heat. As a result, the liquid inside of the propane tank cools very quickly. And I'm not talking theoretical issue, five or 10 minutes later, you might notice it. Within a minute or so, the temperature drops enough that the vapor pressure drops enough and you find that you often have to goose the throttle continuously to keep the same amount of volume moving through there because the pressure keeps dropping. To show you how significant that cooling is, I'm gonna show you a little demonstration here. I have a little spray can, this sort of bottled air, and it contains a hydrocarbon, just like the propane. And I have a little thermistor taped to the side of this and a temperature gauge. I have a little timer here and I'm gonna spray out the liquid and you can see what happens to the temperature rather quickly. And let's start it going. Watch that temperature. This is a full tank of this liquid. So there's a fair amount of heat capacity inside of there. And you see what's happening? 15 seconds into it and we're about 20 degrees colder. And you can hear, if you listen carefully, the speed, the amount of gas being released decreases as the vapor pressure decreases. At 30 seconds, we're well below freezing. This is icy cold down here. It's a big deal. Now you might think, well, it's full, but there's not that much liquid in there. There's a heck of a lot more liquid in the propane tank, so maybe it'll take a lot longer. It really doesn't. It's pretty proportional because you're also taking a lot more vapor off of the propane tank than you are out of that little canned air tank. So within a few, maybe 30 seconds, you significantly notice the significant drop in the vapor pressure. Now one Band-Aid that you could use is you could take these containers and you could put them in a big bucket of hot water in order to raise the vapor pressure and transfer heat. It works surprisingly poorly because the amount of heat that can get through the outside of the tank is nowhere near the amount of heat that's required to vaporize that liquid propane. And so the temperature will drop a little more slowly, but not much. And certainly for a mobile application, like on the back of a go-kart, you could imagine taking one of these big bulky tanks and then having a big bucket of sloshing water behind you. I mean, it's like a funny scene from Top Gear. You don't want to do that. One alternative is to use liquid propane. If you were to invert the tank and allow liquid to flow into the engine, the only vaporization that has to occur is to make up for that small volume increase as the liquid is being pushed out. That's not very much vaporization, it won't cool. The challenge there though is a lot of these newer propane tanks, like the kind we get from the big box stores, these exchange programs and many of the newer propane tanks that you can buy, have an integral float valve so that when you invert the tank, probably for the safety of the barbecuer, it shuts off. It won't flow vapor or liquid. So you have to get a special tank. The older tanks or tanks made for forklifts or industrial purposes, they don't have that shut off, so they would work.
Another application, another means of solving that problem like we did a few years ago, is we transferred the liquid propane into a tank that has a siphon at the bottom, just like the nitrous tanks do. So the pressure on the top pushes the liquid out. But then you face another problem with propane. Because of the fact that you want to throttle the engine, you need some way to restrict the flow. And if the restriction isn't at the nozzle, but you want to be able to mechanically throttle it, once you start closing some sort of restrictive valve, you create flow resistance and the pressure downstream from the valve plummets. The liquid begins to vaporize and what you end up sending up your tubing into your engine is a combination of bubbles and liquid and vapor and you get pulsatile fuel delivery. We saw that in the very first smaller jet engine that we built a few years ago, you get a lot of surging and irregular flow. So either you're going to run this at 100% and use the nozzle as the restriction, or you're going to have a problem with throttling. So for that, those reasons, even though this might be a nice way to start the project, you're going to want to get into liquid fuel. Now, one of the biggest things that will make this engine work well is pressure, pressure, pressure. The higher pressure that you can deliver, the better you're going to get the fuel to atomize because if you use a small nozzle with a lot of pressure behind it, you'll get very tiny droplets, lots of surface area, very quick evaporation, and very good burning. The problem with most fuel pumps that you can get for, from aftermarket suppliers or on Amazon is they typically top out around 40, 50, maybe 60 PSI. It's not bad, but remember it's the net pressure that matters. When we're pumping liquid fuel into a pressurized chamber like this that's around 25 PSI gauge, we need 25 PSI gauge just to begin dripping the fuel in. It's the net difference that makes the actual atomization. So 40 or 50 PSI is not so good. And when we get to compound turbocharging and are running 70, 80, 90 PSI in here, we need substantially higher pressures. There's a real good solution. I got these pumps from uh, AEM Performance Electronics. These are available on Amazon. They cost about 120 bucks. And they're designed for racing applications to inject water methanol mix to cool the charge in order to increase horsepower. These are really convenient because they're 12 volt supply, so you can run them on a battery. This will deliver up to 200 PSI, and it really does. It could actually go higher, but there's a little overflow inside of here that prevents it from damaging itself. These are great pumps for methanol, but I've also run them on isopropyl, rum, diesel, and kerosene. And I've run them for years. I've not had any material compatibility problems, no leakage. They've always worked. I've never run gasoline through them, but you're not going to want to use a volatile liquid like gasoline in something like this. So for what it's worth, they work and they're relatively convenient to use. Now, controlling or throttling the engine with a liquid fuel means you have to change the pressure. One way to do that is you could just put a variable resistor in line, lower the voltage, and control the pump output that way. A more common way to do this with most fuel delivery systems is a circular pattern of fuel flow. You essentially use a feed line and a return line. If you look at the side of the jet engine, you'll see that there are two tubes hanging off the side to go into the fuel tank. One line allows the fuel to be drawn up into the pump, which self primes. It'll pull it right up out of the fuel tank, even if there's a column of air in here, there's no liquid. It'll deliver that high pressure fuel or that fuel out the other side of the pump and then into this manifold, which I have located right here. This manifold then at the end allows the fuel to be returned in a loop. The way you control the throttle is with this valve right here on the return line. As I close this valve down, I increase the resistance and the pressure upstream rises. And as it rises, that's the pressure that's seen by the tube that comes out here and eventually goes all the way up into the engine. At this point, I have a ball valve, just a simple on-off valve. You want this because if there's a little bit of resistance in your flow loop and you get a couple PSI delivering, you don't want to be dripping fuel into shutting down engine and filling it up with fuel. So you want a positive shut off and shut on. Now, one problem with these pumps or challenge with these pumps is unlike the gear pumps in a lot of fuel uh, delivery systems, they're pistons. And so they produce an output that sounds a lot like 
about that frequency, about that volume. And it produces a pulsatile output of pressure. You'll notice that in the chamber because the fuel delivery becomes pulsatile. So to get rid of that, we put in a standpipe in the high pressure part. This vertical larger diameter tube contains a column of air that goes all the way up to the top. At the top I have a little drain valve that just allows me to drain all the fuel out at the end of a, of a run. But this is normally kept closed. This trapped column or bubble of air acts as a spring, a compliant spring, so that when the pressure pulsations occur, instead of occurring in a completely solid liquid fueled system, this takes up those pulsati pulsatile out the, the pulsatile output. And so the gauge will rise nice and smooth, the fuel flow is very smooth, it's very easy to use. And I haven't had any kind of leakage or any problems with it. It's a great way to do the fuel delivery. Now the fuel delivery on the afterburner is very similar. It's the same sort of design, same pump, same pressure manifold, same return restriction that allows you to control the pressure. There's a couple of differences. One is on the output going up to the afterburner, I placed another valve in here. The reason I did is early on I was not sure how well I would be able to control flow with just varying the pressure. Turns out you really don't need this. I often run this just wide open and control my fuel delivery by just restricting the return flow. So I wouldn't recommend duplicating this, it's just a waste of money. The other issue is this is not used very often. Whenever I'm running the jet engine I'm always going to deliver fuel but I'm not always going to run the afterburner. So the afterburner uses this high current, low voltage marine switch. It's rated to I think 32 volts and about 200 amps. And this on off switch simply allows me to turn the pump off so I'm not running it all the time when it has no purpose. Just why wear it out? That's pretty much it for the fuel delivery. The little fittings that I use are kind of interesting. I'm using a high pressure polyethylene line. This stuff is rated to really high pressures and is pretty inflexible. But it works very well, it's compatible with all the fuels, and it's extremely inexpensive. To connect this, I use these fittings. I don't know if you can easily see them. But what these fittings do is it allows you to place this tubing in the end of the fitting like this. And as the tube goes into the fitting, it passes a little O-ring. So the O-ring will end up maybe oh, six or seven millimeters up here, and that's what does the sealing. A little bit beyond the O-ring, near the end of the fitting, there are little teeth that bite into this tubing and they're like shark's teeth. They're one-way teeth. When you push this in, it locks the tubing in and you can't pull it out. It's a very secure fitting. These cost about six bucks. They're very easy to use. To get the tubing out, you simply compress this little ring at the far end and as you compress it, it opens up those little teeth, those little shark's teeth, and allows you to pull the tubing out. It's the same sort of system that they have in the pumps. So using this type of tubing throughout makes it very easy to put everything together. It doesn't leak and it stands very high pressures. In addition, these things are also swivel. So when you mount everything down on the surface, you can take a lot of bend out of the tubing, make everything nice, even, easy turns without it doing any kinking of the tubing, and that swivel doesn't leak. So not bad for six bucks each. Finally, the gauge. This is a simple pressure gauge. You can get them for about 15 bucks. I get almost everything that I am using here from McMaster Car. It's a great company, a very broad range of product line. This particular gauge is just empty. It contains air. The gauges that we're using in here are very similar, about the same cost, but they're glycerin filled. And if you look, you'll see the little meniscus of the glycerin right here. The reason for doing that is on any kind of an application where there's vibration, it tends to damp the vibration of the needle. And that just makes it a little bit easier to read them than to get a little vibration in the needle. It also gives it much more longevity because it eats up some of that energy that would otherwise be going into that little indicator line. And that's pretty much it for the fuel system. I'd highly recommend going to this. You might want to start out with the propane because it's so easy to use when you first get started, but I'm sure very soon you'll want to end up using something like this. Below the video, we're going to uh, put a list of all of the supplies that we use for this, the actual item numbers from McMaster Car, so that you can get the different valves, different styles of valves, connectors, tubing, and the pump, obviously AEM, get it on Amazon. 
Thanks very much for watching. Next time what we're going to be showing you is the oil and cooling system as well as the uh, control equipment and monitoring system. So I'll see you soon. You take care.